I mean, we'll give us a few minutes before we get started, let people get organized and running from meeting to meeting, I'm sure. And guys, um, for those of you who are new to us, welcome. I know I see a few uh, new names here. So we love interaction. So if you are in the situation where you can unmute and pop your cameras on, that would be great. We'd love to see your faces and for other people to join in. So uh, good to see you, Najim. How are you? Good, good. Good evening, right? Should I say good ah, evening to all of you? Good evening for you today. Where are you, where are you dialing in from? I'm from Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah. So it's definitely evening time. How was your day? <laughs> it's 7 p.m. right now here. That's awesome. Good to see you all. Thanks a lot. Yeah, for thanks for seminar. joining. What time thanks is it lot. over there? I'm usually a little it's bit more. It's 7 p.m. Same okay. time, AST, 7 p.m. Well, that's easy. Right, just other side of the clock. So that's excellent. Good. Excellent. James, I know it's good to see you. I don't know if you're on the run again, but we'll uh, give it another minute for people to join in. And by the way, uh, make sure you check out that chat window. So what we want to do is as you're coming in, uh, Teresa has a question for you. So if you click on over to menti.com, it's a quick and easy question. So we're going to uh, feel, read the room a little bit before we get started today. Sure. Okay. Excellent. Welcome, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Ruth, it's good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm at work, so I'll probably be on mute. Yes, a lot of, a lot of muted uh, conversations here today, right? So, um, and it's really interesting hearing all these people at work because we're in the process of relaunching the remote career revolution, right? For all these people who are working at home, like, I want to go back to that again. So it's, uh, you know, I'm out of practice seeing everybody uh, in the office again. So it's interesting. All right, so we are a few minutes past. So Kelly, I'm sure you're gonna keep letting people in as they come. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started because I know Teresa has a ton of great information for us today. Um, for those of you who are new to me, yeah, I'm leaders to make a big impact and love every single Monday. And part of helping our community really step into all of the things they love is to bring expert speakers in to round out your knowledge, your experience, and just give you something new and different to think about in terms of how you navigate your career. And I am so excited today to have Teresa Quinlan with us. She's an EQ expert and she's just a rock star. So I met her through a mutual challenge software that we both use and I immediately fell in love with her. Like I gotta get to know her more and figure out what she has so we can bring that to the community. And Teresa brings 30 years, over 30 years of leadership experience and about 19 years developing leadership development programs and training and all of those things. And so she's gonna be sharing her perspectives and her knowledge on how we can be better at the whole human interaction, which I think is what this is all about. So Teresa, welcome and thank you for joining. I know all of us are coming in hot in terms of meetings and you know moving from one thing to the next. So Teresa, if you can help us give us one thing that we should get into the mindset of so we can get the most out of this session, that would be a great way to kick us off. Thanks, Tammy. So one of the things that I do is I just check in with myself and I ask myself the question, why did I decide to be here? Because I could be doing a whole bunch of other things probably, but I chose to be here, so why not be here? <laughs> Then maybe secondary to that is knowing what you want to get out of it. So if you have an idea already of why you wanted to come to this, what attracted you to it and what you want to get out of it, then that makes the time you're spending relevant. But I think it also engages you to want to ask the questions that you need answers to. Great. All right. So I'm out. Okay. So Teresa, why don't you get us kicked off? This is great. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So thanks. Thanks for having me, Tammy. It's great to be here. You know, talking about emotional intelligence sometimes is a bit of a waste of time. And I say that with levity behind it because we don't become more emotionally intelligent by reading a book or listening to someone talk about it because these are skills that we use. 
they shift our behaviors, they shift our mindset. We have to actively engage with them for them to make a difference. So our emotional intelligence, very unlike our personality and our IQ, are developable skills throughout our entire life. We simply have to put in the time and effort to practicing them to make them stronger. If we relate that to anything else in life that we've learned that is a skill for us, then we recognize the truth behind that statement. If I dedicate time and practice and I roll personal feedback and other feedback into how am I doing, into my learning experience, then I will get better and better at the thing I want to get better at. So I have a bit of an agenda and really that agenda is to engage with like what is emotional intelligence and maybe more importantly what it isn't so really quickly making sure we have our head wrapped around what it is why it's considered the intersection of where emotions and cognition meet like why is it an intersection point and as promised i'm going to give you a practice that helps to lay the foundation for self-mastery so when we think of our emotional intelligence skills we need to have a strong foundation at the base of it in order for us to access a lot. And the foundation is self-mastery or emotional self-awareness and impulse control. Those are the two skills that lay the foundation. And then there's 13 other skills from there that we'll be able to readily access, which may sound like a lot, and it can feel like a lot, but if you're, an, if you're a golfer or have ever golfed and you're like, well, there's like lots of clubs in the bag. I have to understand the club and know when to use it. And then in the opportune moment, pull the club out and use the club. So we think of our eye skills in exactly the same way. If I have the skill, I just have to recognize when to pull it out and use it. So it's a very intellectual process, which sometimes might be surprising when we think of the words emotional intelligence, we might not go directly towards, oh, it's an IQ based thing, but it's an EQ based thing. Which one is it? It's both. That's why it's an intersection. So I'm going to share my screen and in doing so, I um, want to bring up the model of emotional intelligence. If you don't mind, can I ask a question, Teresa? Absolutely. How do we calculate EQ? So this model, great question. This model, the EQI mm -hmm. 2.0, has an associated assessment with it, uh, developed back in the 80s by Reuven Baron. Mm -hmm. And it, through a series of 133 questions that have been rigorously tested to actually assess emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. it provides you with a profile, aka something that looks like this. Can you see this? Yeah. So this is someone's emotional intelligence profile, basically showing their measure of EQ across the five composites and 15 skills. So the self-perception, that's how we view ourselves, both from a standpoint of- Same as self-awareness, right? Weaknesses? Do I love myself? Yeah, yeah no, self-awareness is a component of self-perception. Okay. Yeah. Um, Self-expression, so how we show up in the world and our authenticity, interpersonal, how we relate to other people and demonstrate skills like empathy, decision-making, so being able to use impulse control and objectivity and not letting our emotions drive our decisions, and then stress management, how resilient are we within emotions and uncertainty, and do we have a layer of optimism that we are capable of applying to challenges and adversity. So when we assess emotional intelligence, basically what shows up is a level of proficiency in use of those skills. Now you can self-assess using this assessment, or you can self and rater assess, meaning other people answer the survey with, based on their experience with you and observing you in these skills. And so others would also be able to say, this is what I think and I see their EQ skill set to be at. Now, in leadership, it's incredibly important to have 360 evaluations because we may have mm -hmm. a perception of how we're doing and then other people provide us with feedback that says yes or that says no. And their no doesn't necessarily mean that they think less than we think. Their no might mean 
you actually exhibit that skill better than you think you do. Right. So it can go in both directions that people can assess this and say, you think your skills are better than they are, <laughs> or <laughs> you're not giving yourself enough credit. Blind spots so, exist in both ways, right? So. Yeah. So how do we access this? How do we get this done? Is there a tool? Uh, yes, you need a certified practitioner like myself to run the assessment. Yeah. You can't. However, okay. um, Salave mm -hmm. and um, oh crap, I can't remember the other guy's name. My apologies. You can access free emotional intelligence assessments, not this one, but you can access mm -hmm. other ones. They're not valid and reliable, but okay. they'll be sort of a baseline marker of how you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So when we think of emotional intelligence, we want to be able to think about what is it exactly? And where I like to start is what it isn't. So it isn't about being more emotional. It isn't about being a robot either. So it's not these extremes of a pendulum. It also isn't about sitting in a circle, holding hands, singing Kumbaya. So the word emotion is often the one that gets people stuck with the phrase emotional intelligence. What it is, is it's our ability to understand how we create our emotions and how those emotions impact our behaviors and impact those people around us. And so when we think of behaviors, it's the impact of our emotions on how we show up in the world. So our level of authenticity, or do we put on masks? It's our ability to articulate and communicate our thoughts. So can we be assertive? It's our ability to form relationships, pick up on social cues, demonstrate empathy and understanding, our ability to make decisions, to complex problems, to work with other people that disagree with us, to manage through conflict, to manage through tension, to handle life's fastballs. So our emotional intelligence is a heck of a lot more than just understanding our emotions and being able to accurately name them. However, where we need to start is there because that's the foundation of emotional intelligence is emotional self-awareness, which is being able to name our emotions and the nuances of them. So as an example, happy is a core emotion. So if we assume happy on the scale of happiness is the word we're going to stick in the middle of the scale of happy. And the scale goes from low end to high end of happiness. How many words can you put on that line that describe the nuances of the experience of happy? Test it out. Draw a line on a piece of paper, put happy in the middle, start from the low end which is on the left, to the high end on the right, and see how many words, emotion words, you can identify that describe traversing the low to high end of the core emotion of happy. All right, what do we have? And you can pop yours in the chat. Like Andrew mentioned, you're just listening. You can pop your words in the chat and what is your scale is different. Yep, excited on the high end, good. <laughs> <laughs> like for example, mine goes content, pleased, merry, happy, joyful, excited, elated, enthusiastic. How about anxious? So anxious is an expression of happiness for you? Sometimes, I mean, uh, 
mixed feelings is there not exactly sure that you won a lottery you got the award you you stand first in the university so it's like you know you you know that you, maybe you are the first candidate you are anxious you are not exactly that you should be happy or not till the result is announced ah so that might be under the core emotion of fear mm, so okay. you know the direction it goes in then you decide <laughs> okay. so you're right because you're right in the, in the sense that we can interpret the emotion of anxious because of how it feels in our body in one of two ways we might uh see it through the filter of happy and we might see it through the uh, through the filter of fear it depends on how we're wired because they feel very similar in our body they're energetic could be pleasant it depends on how i interpret my signals okay mm -hmm. uh, can you just repeat what was your on your scale from low to end um yeah sure i'll even type them in the I apologize for any spelling errors, but I tried to do this. <laughs> Typing under pressure is always so hard. <laughs> it's a little challenging. Yes. Okay. So what's interesting about our emotional and actually impacts our performance so when we think about cognition iq from a very young age we are put into a system that values iq huh? highly it's called school <laughs> <laughs> and so from like a super young age we start getting scored on how smart we are and then we start getting stack ranked on how smart we are compared to other people and this becomes, in essence, a high commodity. How smart are you? Yeah. And so we enter a workplace that is measuring things other than our IQ. Uh, but we haven't had a whole heck of a lot of training or development in that yet. And so when we enter the workplace, sometimes we can struggle with working with other people <laughs> or managing the stress. And this is often when EQ comes into play. Because now we're looking at, well, what are the influences to performance? If we know that you're already smart enough, but you're struggling to access that intellect, what's the problem? And the problem is often the emotions. There are emotions that are interfering with my ability to access my IQ. So the brain functions in a very unique way. One, it filters stimuli, external and internal, through your amygdala first. This is just your reptilian brain, and it's going fight or flight. Is this a threat? If I perceive it as a threat, I'm doing fighting, I'm flighting. The next thing it does is it processes the information through your limbic system, which is our sensory system. So our feelings, aka emotions, which is why your body signals you when you have emotions. We feel our emotions in our body. It's a brain activity signaling the body on purpose. Ruth, we'll get to your question in a second because it's a really good one. And then the next is cortex. And this is where your rational, logical IQ lives. So it is the third place that information, the last place that information is processed, which means if you experience fear at a high level or threat at a high level, you don't access your IQ, which we are fully aware of. When the pandemic started, there was this mass consumption of toilet paper. <laughs> and I don't know about all of you, but when that showed up, the first thing I did was, hang on a second, if my survival counts on toilet paper, we're in trouble. Yeah. Mm. So it was a fear-based response and a non-rational, non-logical behavior outcome. So we saw that the fear, the emotion of fear, threat to survival, interrupted accessing the intellect. Now, that's, an ex that's kind of an extreme example. So we can think of even small movements in our state of wellness. So you and I will have a state of wellness within which we flourish, we function, we access our IQ, our personality, our talents, everything, attributes. Man, we are in flow. We are jiving in that space of wellness. And we'll have emotions 
that are necessary for that state. As soon as we move outside of that state of wellness to what is known as pebble emotions, we can start to have disruptions to our ability to access our intellect. So think about when you might be irritated, which could be a pebble emotion, or I'm agitated by something, which could be a pebble emotion, or, or I'm feeling tired, could be a pebble emotion. And all of a sudden, how I choose to behave, how I choose to speak to someone, how I choose to solve a problem shifts. Not the same solution or the same behavior if I was in a state of wellness. I don't approach the situation in the same way. So the further I move away from wellness, pebble, brick, boulder emotions, the more toxic the behavior becomes, the more disruptive the behavior becomes. And whether that behavior is self-detrimental or other detrimental. Our ability to notice... Our ability to notice movement from that state of wellness, catch the signal and correct it to stay in wellness is how we flex our emotional intelligence. First, we have to be aware and then we can manage. So when you think of emotional intelligence, what comes to mind for you? As in, how do you use it? What do you know about it? How do you see it showing up or not showing up? You'll have to unmute if you want to share your thoughts. It's like sometimes we are unable to distinguish between thoughts and the feelings, how to react. Uh, sometimes when we ask people, how are you? You know, sometimes the response is, I don't know. I have mixed feeling. I'm happy also because there's something happened good. Or I'm sad also because something happened last night, something or two days before. So emotions. Yes. Because humans are messy. <laughs> <laughs> we're complex, we're messy. It's very rare that we experience only one emotion at mm. any time. So right. we'll have lots of emotions that we're experiencing, but when we're asked that question, we believe we have to give one singular answer. So what do people end up saying? Fine, not bad. Mm. Okay. okay. Mm. That's right. Let me give the generic blend of them. And so that's the response that we get. However, if we actually picked it apart, then our answer would be, well, I'm feeling extremely happy about my workout this morning and my breakfast was delicious. I'm so grateful. And I'm a little frustrated by this email that's waiting in my inbox because I already told them an answer and they don't want to do it. And I'm also feeling, and I'm also feeling, and I'm also feeling. And, you know, 10 minutes goes by and this person goes, well, I mean, you could have just said fine. It was a rhetorical question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think for me, um, it, it's working when actually I deliver, I actually, the end result is what my intent was. Say more, please. Well, as in, um, I've read the room and so I've actually realized that if, if I want to get a certain thing done, I can't go in hard. I've got to come, I've got to ask other people questions and get them involved so that I get to where I want to go. And so what, what can happen with me is definitely I, I, I get there quicker. Uh, so my brain works quick sometimes, too quick. And um, I don't bring people with me. I, I've had a tendency to not bring with people. So I've, what I'm learning is I have to slow down. So I've developed coping mechanisms when I can feel that somebody said something that's irritated me or is not picking something up. I take my glasses off nice. and slow myself down. So all the people that know me now know that if I take my glasses off, I'm thinking. <laughs> it's a good physical clue, right? Yeah. Well, no, and I had, to, I had to build it because I got, you know, I was, especially when you, at the moment, everything, it, it, forget even what's happened with the pandemic, just even before. I mean, there's not usually black and white answers to anything. 
There's not a clear way forward. Because if there's a clear way forward, we'd all be going that way. It's just this, life's very complicated and there are lots of pros, cons, yes, no, which way can you do it? And so when you ask for people's feedback, I think to a large extent, Teresa, you were saying people don't necessarily want to put, dip their toe into the truth. They hesitate a bit. So it's quite hard to get a consensus opinion to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, that's what I, I'm sort of going around the houses a bit on two different things, but I think this, that, that when you, when I'm using, when I feel like I'm flexing the EQ part of me is when I stop and look and listen more, listen more probably. Yeah. Yes, probably. Absolutely. I mean, one of our primary skills in emotional intelligence that I get the most amount of questions around is empathy. So Will provided his answers like empathy and understanding and open-ended questioning. That is absolutely a demonstration of our emotional intelligence when we're in conflict or tension. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I think it's important to also say, you know, when we're in flow and when things are clicking with everyone else, we're, we're probably in an unaware state that we are using our emotional intelligence, but really in those situations, we don't even need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We more actively engage in our emotional intelligence when we're not in those states. When disagreement and conflict and um, varying beliefs, challenging problems or adversity or change and uncertainty, when that's going on around us, we got to pull up our socks and our EI skills a lot. And empathy is a huge one we have to use because uh, to Ruth's comment above, what if emotions have become numb is that I might be experiencing what's happening in a particular way. And so that's going to fuel how I think about it and my perspective on it and my ideas about it and my own experiences from my past are fueling it. And you in that space has a completely different experience. <laughs> And empathy is our ability to understand each other. And so when we're emotionally charged up, we're less likely to ask how other people are feeling because we're stuck in our own feelings. So we have feelings about our feelings. <laughs> and that, oh. that happens because we label them as good or bad. Mm -hmm. But I, I, the, one of the reasons why I started to get more into this and, and look and try and understand it was, I had a, was having a big team meeting and I said, look, I really want to just get everybody's, I want to listen to everybody, I want everybody to get their ideas on the table, let's brainstorm. So I said, right, okay, brainstorming session, no, brainstorming hats on, let's all like put everything on. And I sort of, we ended up with this one guy turning around and I said, so, so what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And he said, can I get back to you? And, it, and I thought, okay, so obviously that didn't work because he was like, I put him into a flight position <laughs> immediately <laughs> when the intent is like some, some introverts can't brainstorm. They just don't know how to, because it, it freaks them out because they, they need to think things through. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They can't go first. No, they can't go first. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when someone says that, you just go, yeah, I'll come back to you. And yeah. Then yeah. <laughs> honestly honest to god that's what happened yeah and it made me realize i need to understand more about just introverts extroverts there's more going on in the way that people process information and how it comes into their brain yeah absolutely is and so ruth to your second question how have current events moved changed shifted wellness emotions no different than any other current situation has So perhaps the question needs to be, how has it shifted it for you? Because there isn't a paintbrush that goes, it's done this to everybody, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we want to do a lot because that makes it easier for me to understand you if you're like me and too much likeness requirements. <laughs> Anything that I would say, just to sort of act, well, qualify that a bit, is I was working from home before, mm -hmm. um, and I found it very hard being one of a couple of people working remotely, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden everybody was remote. Mm -hmm. So I found that quite, and then everybody then knew what it was like to be 
with people. And so I think there was, there was a bit of a paradigm shift of everybody moving to the same, the same feeling. Um, and then a lot of people have chosen not to go back and my company, you don't, that you don't have to go back in. Uh, um, the people are a lot more open on like doing Zoom and, and doing all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for a lot of people, it hasn't been an easy transition and no. they don't like it and they don't no. want it. They need to go back into a space with other people. And for others, it's the other. This is kind of the thing. What our emotional intelligence helps us do is it helps yeah. us to put yourself in other people's shoes experience. so you know that don't assume that they're going to react the same way you did. Yeah. So part of that under the self-perception realm is understanding how are my beliefs showing up and impacting how I feel about what's going on and how I behave and what's going on. My willingness to understand someone else and their experience and their perspective and accept that it might be different than mine because empathy is often confused for agreement and empathy has nothing to do with agreement. It simply has to do simply, but not easy in execution. <laughs> is understanding someone else's perspective and experience and behaving in a way that respects that understanding and perspective. That's the second part. Like, I get it, but I'm not going to act in a way that respects it. That's not empathy. <laughs> <Sour ones. laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So a lot of times we think we're using empathy and we're stopping short of empathy. So that was, a, that was a great discussion. Thanks for bringing us in, into that, Carrie. And Ruth, thank you for um, providing some questions there to fuel the conversation. So um, the foundation of EI, self-mastery, and two skills within emotional intelligence that are related to self-mastery are impulse control and emotional self-awareness. So impulse control is simply our ability to avoid rash decision-making, and rash behaviors. We call these knee-jerk reactions. So in the flash of, a, of an emotion, because some of our emotions are flashy, they hit the pan like a really, like oil on a hot pan, like a really hot pan. <laughs> You're emotionally off the rails. So you go red and you have a knee jerk reaction when you go red. And sometimes people have really abrasive red behaviors and sometimes people have very quiet red behaviors. So that's the pendulum swing. And we need to recognize within ourselves and in other people what their red looks like. Red just means danger. Red for me doesn't mean anger. It means I'm in a danger zone and that could happen out of any emotion for someone. So. I might either be abrupt and abrasive and really toxic with my behaviors, or I could totally withdraw and go super quiet and sabotage behind the curtains. You wouldn't even know because I've completely disengaged. When we're in leadership, sometimes we don't know because we're too busy paying attention to ourselves. We don't even notice other people have done that or we're uncomfortable addressing it. So emotions have become numb. Mine, theirs, everybody's, just don't wanna talk about it. It's uncomfortable. So we can consider for ourselves, why do emotions become numb or uncomfortable? Why do we compartmentalize them and shove them away? One, we could have been taught that. We could have been taught that our emotions are unimportant, meaningless, a distraction. We could have been taught that certain emotions are bad, so don't have them. Certain emotions are good, try to have them. We could have taught, we could have been taught or modeled that in certain emotions you behave a certain way. This is what anger looks like. This is what happiness looks like. And then we sort of be that's not the case. Because when I'm angry, it doesn't look like that. When I'm happy, it doesn't look like that. How I create and express my emotions and then name them is different than how someone else does. So it's fascinating when we think of old 
research and theory around emotions is it's completely different than current day theory around emotions. So old is every emotion has a fingerprint, so it looks the exact same way for everyone. And we know this to not be true because when we say to somebody, why are you angry? And they're like, I'm not angry. Yeah, your eyebrows are furrowed. That means you're angry. Like, no, I'm concentrating. Well, when my eyebrows are furrowed, I'm angry. And? <laughs> and then new research shows that only about 70% of our emotional experience is the same as someone else's when we call it the same thing. So that leaves a 30% difference. So anything bigger than 10% is statistically significant. 30% difference in how we experience and create our emotions is big. So immediately out of the gates, one of the things that we can do to improve our emotional intelligence when it comes to relationships is stop labeling what other people are feeling. And instead, share your observation and ask them a question. For example, hey, I noticed your eyebrows were furrowed. What's going on? And then they'll say, I'm concentrating. <laughs> or they'll say, I can't figure out this problem and I'm a bit frustrated by it. And you're like, okay, so that's what's going on for them. And that, when we do that, what happens is the other person gets to fill us in. And rather than being and attaching our meaning to it, which, you know, when we do that, we don't get it right very often. And that's like it, in relationship, it kind of blows up the relationship a little bit or a lot. <laughs> well, especially when you add on that, we don't talk about it. Right. That we just assume right. you look yeah. like this, you acted like this. I assume you were this. So I'm going to respond like that. And then all of a sudden you're in this, you know, neither one of you are doing it in terms of those communications. So now you're in a spiral, right? You're in that death spiral, whether it's at work or, you know, but, um, but I don't know about, I want to say this again, because at least for me, this was a huge aha moment in terms of, you know, stop labeling what you think people are feeling. Um, Cause that, that just triggered me. I was like, I think I do that all the time um, because of course they're thinking the same thing I do. Why wouldn't they? Right. And so you don't even know you're doing it. Um, so yeah, that was a huge aha moment for me. So I just wanted to slow down for a hot second and just make sure, see if anybody else had that same like light bulb moment. <laughs> I agree. And I think sometimes as <clears throat> maybe it is a, a, a female thing, but there are times that we think we're helping other people out by doing that because we're, we're trying to understand how everybody's yeah. feeling, but we're making assumptions about what that actually is. I, I agree. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. And Valerie, I think to extend on that, when it's a challenging emotion for them, so you notice they're out of wellness, when we do that, it just escalates it. We rarely help the yeah. situation. <laughs> More often than not, it escalates it. And then we're caught in this conversation of trying to justify what we did and explain what we did and what our intention, intention really was. And by that point, the other person is like, I'm out of this conversation. I'm not even in this conversation with you anymore. <laughs> I'm out of here. I don't want to be in this. Well, yeah. so I've registered, we're going to, I think, probably catch the replay. Um, and one of the things I know through my coaching and my experiences as a leader, and I'm sure you felt it too, is that I call it people respond to the shadow. Like if you think of a leader with the sun behind them, and you've got this shadow that makes them look nine feet tall, um, you look in the mirror and you just see you. And as you move up through the organization and as you have more influence and impact, that shadow gets bigger and bigger. And that's what people respond to is not you, but the, what you represent. And so how do you leverage this EQ um, capabilities and being aware that people are, they may not be responding to the true you and your intent, but what you represent. And, you know, and you're, cause let's face it, you're going to talk to your boss way different than you're going to talk to the CEO of an organization, right? Your boss is, there's no way that project's getting done. And the CEO is, well, we're doing everything we can to get it back on track and things look good. Right. So, um, and so how do we use EQ to really deconstruct for our teams and give them a safe place to really respond to us the way we want them to? Oh, that is such a complex, like, I know. 
walked in there, I'm like, oh my God, we need like a half day to go to your home. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> okay, no, that's okay. So one is our one is our our capacity to show up authentically. And sometimes the word authenticity is overused. So when we think about that in leadership, um, being authentic is recognizing that while I may not believe I am above or on a pedestal or have a, this title and so that means there's a layer of expectation that's unspoken from other people mm -hmm. I might not have to be aware that that might be what's happening and I also need to be aware in leadership that everyone that reports to me is painting me with the brushes of their other leaders. Yes. So they could have had great leaders before and they're coming and they're painting me with like this better, this person better be great, this person and lots of expectations on me, or they might be painting me with their crappiest leader and going, I'm looking for all the things that you're going to do wrong because my past leaders did everything wrong. So first thing is we have to be aware when we step into leadership that those are going to be lenses that people will look at us at. We can't control that. What we can do is show up authentically and put deposit after deposit after deposit into someone else's trust bank. So when I say something and I don't do it, I'm withdrawing from someone's trust bank. When I say something and I follow through, I'm depositing into their trust bank. When I spend time with coffee to have a conversation with a coworker and ask them about, or a direct report and ask them about their goals, their life, their kids, their pets, their whatever, I'm depositing into their trust bank. When I have a private conversation with the direct report about an expectation that they missed and I give them space to talk about what happened, why it happened, and I coach them to finding solutions and I give them resources, I'm putting a deposit in their trust bank. When I allow a teammate to behave toxically in a meeting and I don't address it in the meeting space, I'm depositing, I'm withdrawing from everybody's trust bank. So we have to consider as leaders, every single behavior we do is either a deposit or a withdrawal into trust banks. And the more I deposit, the more possible psychological safety exists. And when that exists, we can do anything. We can collaborate, we can disagree. and challenges. So if you're recognizing that you aren't um, in a team environment that is doing all of that, then you have to look at the base, the foundation of it. And the foundation of it is you as the leader. How are you leading? How are you creating the culture that says this is allowed, this is not allowed? Excellent. Great, great piece of advice to get started on that. That's for sure. Yeah. And I know I asked an elephant of a question, so sorry about that. I just got really excited. Okay, elephant questions are beautiful. Yeah. Um, Ellen, you came off mute. Oh, I did? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, but I actually did want to make a comment. I like you, Tam, uh, Tammy. Uh, nice tan, by the way. Um, yeah, could you get any browner? My goodness. Um, anyway, uh, I... I too thought that the the labeling emotions was had a lot of impact too. Like wow, um, and I think I think that you said that only thirty percent of ours are the same. Seventy are the same. Thirty aren't. Different. Yeah. So for okay, example, it's different. When I when I say that I am feeling joyful, and you say I'm feeling joyful too, and then we talk about everything that we're using to create the meaning of what joyful is for us, what it feels like in our body, how it impacts our behavior, how it impacts those around us, 70% of our description of that will be similar and 30% of it will be different. Okay, that's huge. Yes. That's huge, it's really, that's really huge, yeah. Which is why when we see someone doing something behaviorally and we name the emotion of it, we usually get it wrong. Because mm -hmm. yeah. we don't have the information of what we see. We just have the seeing. <laughs> and then we bring all of our information. That's huge. I mean, it's huge. It, it starts the conversation off on the wrong foot, you know, and it's only going to go downhill yeah. from there if you're not on the same yeah. page. So yeah, that, that's, 
wow, that's, that's really something. Thank you. You're welcome. So one of the things that I um, teach on in leadership is around this point of less telling and more asking. Mm -hmm. So we can think about in leadership, how often do I say what I think is happening compared to how often do I state my observations and then ask what's happening? So my observation isn't that someone's angry or upset or frustrated or non-productive. That's my label of what I see. My observation is they haven't posted anything today. They haven't moved a project on the project board. Their um, camera was off in meetings and normally it's on. So I make observations and I state the observations, the things that I could see and measure. And then I ask them to tell me what's going on because they're going to hear my observations and go, what, what is going on with me that makes me do those things? And then they'll be able to say, yeah, I'm depressed. I've been anxious. I'm lacking in motivation. I got bad news at home. I didn't get that promotion. It's impacting me. And they'll be able to tell you the stuff that's going on. And then the second thing in leadership is it's not your problem to fix. It's your opportunity to coach. Which means we still don't get to tell. <laughs> and when you think of the self-perception realm of emotional intelligence, this is us checking our ego. I'm the leader. Does that mean I have to know everything? No, especially not about them. I need them to know everything about them. So my coaching at moments is to help them explore what's going on for them, why, how it's impacting them, how it's impacting their work, people around them, what are ways that they come out of that state and into wellness. So what are the things that they need to do to cultivate their wellness for peak performance? How will they go about doing that? When are they going to do it? When will they notice things are different? How are they going to report that back to me? This is coaching, this question after question after question to guide them to their answers and solutions. And then all you got to do is follow up. Like sometimes I think, why is lead, why are we making leadership so hard? Because we want to own everything. And maybe this is an opportunity to hear, you have permission to not own any of it. <laughs> Leave it in the hands of the individual. Have them claim responsibility for their performance. You claim responsibility for the outcomes, expectations, tasks, the stuff that needs to get done. You're responsible for that, which means you have to have conversations that hold people responsible to the performance for that, right? So as a leader, you just have to get really good at having conversations. And you're better at them when you have more successful relationships, deeper relationships. The deeper the relationship, the more trust there is, the more psychological safety, the more you can talk about anything. The harder you find it is to talk with your employee or direct report, that's a big signal that you don't have a good enough relationship with them yet. So what do you need to do? You need to invest in the relationship. Get to know them. Get to know all parts of them. Tell them about you but let them go first unless they're an introvert Carrie and then they go I don't know and you're like okay would you like to hear a little bit about me you have to go first to demonstrate this is a safe place I'm not going to chop your head off because you tell them you've got seven kids at home and it's really hard for you to get work done Will um is it I've always found it that that it's easier for me to go first or it's easier for me to be vulnerable um, and share. And that kind of opens the door for others to potentially share if they want to share, um, as opposed to me trying to ask. And some people may feel like I'm prying or I'm getting too personal. Um, so I always felt like if I'm the open book and I share, that kind of opens it up for other people to to do the same and it builds that environment of, of trust and, and openness. Yeah, wonderful. I love it. I also think we need to give them space not to share. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work with a lot of leaders who don't like to share their personal information. You know, they're just like, I just like to keep it separate. Um, and I think there's a lot of people like that too, just in terms of, you know, work and, 
you know, Teresa, I'd love to hear your opinion on this too, but I think in those situations where you, you want to build trust, and I love the, um, the, the analogies you were giving in terms of that trust bank, right? And everything that you do is either a deposit or withdrawal. I think that helps in terms of building that without having to know that they've got three dogs and, you know, 10 kids and all that kind of fun stuff, right? Um, because not everybody's comfortable being able to do that. So in, in those situations, making sure that your D, what you say and what you do is in just complete alignment all the time um, in terms of building trust with people who don't want to get personal at work. Yes. So I think first, first thing might be is um, you have to be clear on what your leadership philosophy is. Yep. So when you step into leadership, you need to know what kind of a leader are you managing and leading people or are you managing and leading work or are you somewhere in between and along that spectrum and the openness that we need to have with our people of like this is my leadership philosophy this is how i lead and then we have to discover how does that person respond to that kind of leadership how do they prefer to be led what do they want their workplace environment to be like and so i lead not just under my philosophy although that philosophy is a guiding principle for me i also have to recognize oh that person is not going to flourish under me, like going in and telling them about everything personal or me asking them about what's your financial goals? <laughs> like, they be like, Oh, that's a line I'm not crossing. Right. And so, and so getting to know where does everyone's line exist? And I guarantee you those lines will change. So at the beginning of your relationship, they may have really hard lines that keep you very far from them because it takes a while sometimes for some people to establish trust. And we can't just assume that we're doing something wrong and that's why someone doesn't trust us. Look, I put a thousand deposits into your trust bank and you don't trust me yet. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Just takes them a little bit longer than maybe Rosie who trusts first and requires you to break the trust. This is the messiness. We can call it that. And I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean, I mean it in a very positive way. This is the uniqueness of getting to know everyone and then having the leadership tool to use for that occasion. Whether it's an emotional intelligence tool or it's a technical tool or an intellectual tool. So when you're talking about that, you know, <clears throat> to make that tangible, right now, what would seem to me that I kind of experienced this in my company that people are being forced and i use that you know lightly and not but they have to come back to work they have to come back into an office and so they're sitting there and there's about 16 elephants in the living room about them coming back to the office so there has to be some approach and i i would assume that you know emotional intelligence is going to be a big part of that approach to try to get trust back with these individuals to try to understand they've all had different experiences over the last couple of years, but a, a good part of them have probably not been great, right? They've lost loved ones or, you know, they've been very sick themselves. They all have stories now. They all have triggers now. They all have, you know, different types of issues than they might have had three years ago. So what are some, some ways to be authentic and, and sort of take that on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so before you answer that, just Valerie, you checking in with you too on this. I also think um, in addition to those experiences, the majority of people I talk to now define success differently, mm -hmm. right? So you've got yeah. all the trauma and all the experiences, but now you also are coming out the other side saying, what was important to me two years ago is not what's important to me today, right? So with that added to it, because I'm getting some nods on Valerie, so, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'll turn it over to the expert and see what she has to say about that. Yeah, so I, this reminds me of this. So yeah. something that we can do with everybody that we lead and ourselves is identify if I'm the center of my universe, because we all are, <laughs> and I want to have a life that is rich and enjoyable, full of meaning and fulfillment, then there are th certain things I need to have in my life to create that. And if we don't know what these things are, And we won't be able to have a life that's meaningful or fulfilling. We'll, we'll be spending time, energy, and resources on things that aren't. 
So something that we can do with ourselves and with our people is an exercise like this. It's like, okay, so what are these things that create meaning fulfillment? You kind of hope that one of their circles is work, <laughs> right? And then, and then we could talk about this circle for them and say, okay, so when you think of work, what creates meaning and fulfillment in work for you? And then we get to learn what is part of that flow creation. You know what I love doing is I love doing these things. You know what I hate doing? I hate doing these things. And not because I'm not good at them. They just suck the life out of me. And so when we can sort of adjust the work environment for people to play to their strengths more often than their weaknesses, meaning play to the flow zone more often than the suck the life out of me zone, then we can create a work environment where they are looking forward to coming into. This other stuff that isn't work, this is where we ask people to claim responsibility because this is the stuff that will impact the work cycle. And we might not have the relationship with them to know what these things are. They're not telling us about it because maybe they don't feel safe saying it. Or they don't trust you enough to say it, which has nothing to do with you. Don't take it personally when someone doesn't trust you, unless, of course, you're consistently withdrawing from the bank account. <laughs> you could be doing everything that is trust-based and they still don't trust you. That's a them thing, not a you thing. But you have to have that layer of reality testing, like what's really going on, to be sure. Does that help a little bit, Valerie? Yes, thank you very much. Those, uh... come on back, you're gonna love the conversations, right? So right. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure you will. When we do yeah. something like that organizationally, so if you have a, a small right. enough team that you can, sure you everyone will. can do it and you can share, then something that ends up happening is people start to see that what people's lives are like outside of work and the things that may be influencing them. You know, being able to encourage when we come back into the work environment now after three years of being out is having this layer of, I don't know what people's experiences were like. For some people, the pandemic was like, it was something that happened out there and a lot of it happened to other people. And I'm one of those people. Very little of the pandemic touched me. I didn't lose family members or friends. I, I didn't get it. My husband had it, but he had it just recently and it was like a cold. And um, my work didn't struggle. His work didn't struggle. Like we really weren't touched by it in a way that so many people were impacted by it. So to have an opportunity to hear people's impact stories can really help navigate why it's tricky for some people right now. Their fear levels may be high because their impact story is deeper. My fear levels are not, I was okay taking a mask off. Had I have lost as many people as some of my friends or other people have lost, my fear level might be higher going back into an office environment. So that kind of depth of understanding only comes from conversation. And dropping our assumptions that we know. That light bulb moment. Absolutely, right, in terms of labeling. So, all right, Teresa, we've got about a minute left. I think this has been an amazing roundtable conversation. And, you know, hopefully I'm seeing a lot of head nods and I'm, you know, uh, that everybody it's gotten a lot. Of so let's talk about what you do, how you serve your people and those kind of things before we wrap up. Oh, I'm like, oh, right. I have that deck. Is oh, that's okay. We'll send it as an, you guys are all going to get the replay anyway. So you'll get the deck and all that stuff as well. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so easiest way to connect with me is probably just like, you can email me directly and I just popped it into the chat. Teresa at IQEQTQ.com. Or my website is the last part of it, just the iqeqtq.com is my website. And you could check out executive coaching services, corporate training and development, um, programming, assessments, because I know that came up like um, Najami had asked, how do you get an assessment done? So I do assessments and debriefs to help people understand where they're at and what they should be focused on for their development. And I think if everyone here wants to actually start working on their emotional intelligence development, start at the foundation, which is your emotional self-awareness. 
the simple exercise we didn't get to in the description, the <laughs> BFIT exercise takes about 20 seconds to do. So basically you have to pause, take three deep breaths, scan your body for discomfort, like stress in your shoulders, tension in your throat, not in your stomach, pain in your lower back, heaviness in your eyes. We know what discomfort feels like, yeah. And then give an emotion word that matches the discomfort. So you might be feeling anxiety, stress, overwhelm, fatigue, betrayal. And ask yourself what's going on in my life that's contributing to that. And what's one wise action I want to take to resolve it? Breathe, scan, name what's going on in life that's causing it. What's a wise action I want to take to fix it? Fix, resolve, whatever. Notice wise. Yeah. <laughs> wise action. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean have a glass of wine and forget about it. It was funny, actually, because as you were talking, I'm a great one for using alliteration to remember things. And so I've got wellness, wise, and I was just about to put wine into that, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sarah, I think you're my spirit animal here. Right? So. <laughs> okay, the wine works as long as you get to the, the wise action after. That's right. Take the action, then have the wine, right? So uh... <laughs> That's your reward. <laughs> Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for your time. You know how to reach Teresa. So I'm sure you guys have a million more questions, um, but I would encourage you to you know, lean in, check her out on LinkedIn. She has amazing content that helps everybody move faster. And we'll be back uh, three weeks from now with um, Kelly. Who do we have next? So we have our comedian and our improv expert up next. Is that what we have? All right, so we've got Lori coming, who is a uh, part-time comedian improv and part-time career coach. Uh, so she obviously takes a very humorous view at all the things that we struggle with every day. And she's got some really interesting perspectives that I can't wait to share with you guys. So we will see you in three weeks uh, to do that one. But Teresa, thank you again. I've learned so much myself today. Hope everyone else did as well. And um, we'll get you guys the replay out tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Thanks.